Hi there. This is Pastor Jeremy Hetz from Nipigon Baptist Church in Nipigon, Ontario. I want to start by taking time to first and foremost thank you for taking your time to tune in and watch this video sermon or Bible study. It's our desire at Nipigon Baptist to see you continue to grow in your life and walk with Jesus, even though at this current time we cannot physically meet as we try to do our part to battle the spread of COVID-19. So as you watch this video, we encourage you to have your Bibles ready, your pen and paper handy, to get as much out of these messages as you can. Please feel free to share the links to this video and check out our webpage at nipiginbaptist.com for other resources to help during this time of self-isolation. Thanks again, and we are praying for you and for the work that God is doing in your life through the gospel during this unprecedented time in our history. Take care, and God bless. Good morning. Uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and we do hope that it's an encouragement to you as we continue to be unable to meet um, until basically further notice. But we, we want to be here for you. We want to... Um, Still continue to challenge you in your faith and, and hopefully deepen and grow your understanding of Scripture, even though we can't be together. I am just want to start by saying, man, I have been encouraged as of late. And, and I know um, sometimes for us in our lives right now, especially, that can be a difficult thing to say. But but I truly have been encouraged. And and not to say that, that as a person, as a human being, I, I haven't had concerns and I haven't had even the tinge of worry from time to time. But but I've seen God at work. I have found solace in his scripture. I have prayed and uh, and I have found that God is faithful. And, and in all of that, in all of that, we, we look and we say, God, thank you so much for being there for us. But the church as a whole has been overwhelmingly encouraging. Um, the the acts of love and service that I have seen and witnessed uh, continue to stoke my heart. Um, but at the same time, like I, I know and understand that we need that encouragement. We need that, that reminder each and every day that there is a God seated on the throne who is still in control of all things. And I continue to look towards that God. I continue to look to him as as Hebrews chapter 12 reminds us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. This has been a theme verse of mine uh, over the past couple of weeks, just to constantly remind myself where I need to keep my eyes and my gaze located. Because if I put it on anything else, if we as Christians put it on anything else, especially during a time of uncertainty like we're living in now, we very easily will get discouraged, very easily can let fear and anxiety run our lives. And that is not what God desires for his children, for his church during this time. I believe that God desires for us to stand up tall. He desires for us to serve and to love our, our community and fellow neighbors. I believe that God is going to do an amazing work through this pandemic and bring many souls to Christ. Many believers will grow in their faith with him and, and come to mature uh, maturity in Christ. And that, that, is, that is God at work. And so this morning, we're going to continue our series on fear. Um, we, we've been talking uh, about how fear, and, and we kind of looked at the American Psychiatric Dictionary and, and came up with the definition that, that fear is a complex emotion that basically when we feel like there is imminent danger or even as anxiety would say, a future danger or future threat, we, we kind of go into that fight or flight mode. And we begin to, to uh, basically pool all of our blood from our extremities, including our mind, but all the way down to uh, the core of who we are the, in our guts and everything. And then what happens is we, we don't think rationally. I was actually reading a, an interesting article uh, this week. And, and again, can, I won't quote the article. I won't cite the articles. I don't know uh, too much uh, about the person who wrote it. But, but it was interesting because the premise was that when we fear... The same part of our brain that takes over is also the same part of our brain that controls a lot of other things. And that just kind of struck me because oftentimes when we begin to fear, we begin to become overwhelmed by a lot of other stuff. 
And the first week we looked at is that, you know, in the midst of fear, we need to trust God. We need to put our faith and trust in him and him alone. And if we have faith in God, if we can trust God, then, then, then that faith has the capacity as it works within our hearts and our lives to drive out that fear. Last week, we looked at hope. We define hope as a joyful expectation of something better. The joyful expectation of something better. That is what every believer has. No matter what this life throws at us, no matter where, where we go, no matter what we experience, the reality is we have something better to look forward to. As believers, as followers of Christ, we know that if we're here, we have Christ. If we are not here, we pass on from this life into the next, we will be with Jesus Christ. That's what makes it joyful. That's what makes it an expectation of something better. You see, we, we also looked last week at where that hope comes from. We looked at David and his, and his heart, and, and, and when he wrote in the, in the Psalms, he, he said, I wait for your salvation. I hope in your word. He turned to the word of God, the very words that God had given to him, and he clung to them. He held on tight to them. He said, these are what God has given to me as a promise, as a surety that I can hope in him. So we find hope in the word of God. And so uh, the encouragement along that line was, you know, we have some extra time now, don't we? We have some extra downtime, maybe to spend with our families in the word, maybe to spend individually in the word, maybe just to, um, to double down, if you will, and get as much out of our, our downtime as we can. You see, the other place we find hope is in the love of God. We looked at 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, which says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. You see, when we understand how much God loves us and how much God desires to take care of us, we understand something fundamental, that he loves us. And that love that he has for us drives out fear, drives out that anxiety. And so we can fall back on the love that God has for us. And we, and we surrounded all of these ideas with the verse found in 2 Timothy chapter uh, one, starting in verse three, I'm going to read these verses for you. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us the spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. You see, we find hope in the word of God, in the love of God. And we take solace that God has not given us a spirit of fear, where we have to be fearful. We have to wake up and be afraid, but, but rather God has given us a spirit of power, his power at work in us, Love, his love at work in us and of self-control. I love the fact that as we desire to seek and serve God, even in the midst of uncertainty and difficult times, the reality becomes very clear that when we trust in God, when we put our hope in him, when we realize we have a spirit of power and love, it leads us to a life of self-control where we are, we are not panicked. We are not in chaos mode. We are not freaking out because of the fact that God is in control. So I trust at this point you guys have your Bibles. I trust that you guys are ready to go. And so if you guys have your pen and paper, your Bibles out, uh, get ready because we are going to dive into the word this morning. When we talk about um, the idea of fear, but we're going to couple it this time with the idea that joy, joy can overtake and overwhelm our fear. Sorry about that. My mouth is very dry. Let's go ahead and pray and then we will open up the word together. God, thank you for your love and your grace this morning. God, thank you, Lord, for another day that we have breath in our lungs. God, thank you so much, Lord, that we have, even in the midst of uncertainty and upside down lives right now, Lord, we have the ability and capacity to be thankful and content 
with all that you're doing, with all that you've done and all that you are going to do for our lives. So God, thank you so much for all that you've done for us. And thank you, Lord, that you are still on the throne. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I remember when uh, a while back, we used to watch this show called Undercover Boss. Now, it's kind of interesting because this show um, we saw one time and um, it was for this frozen yogurt place and, and uh, called Menchie's. Now, uh, if you live in Thunder Bay or you live in Nipigon, you probably uh, know that there's a Menchie's in Thunder Bay, but but we had we had never heard of this place and and this show, Undercover Boss, we were actually, uh, we had watched the episode and then we were driving in Winnipeg on vacation uh, one year and we, we saw this Menchie's and we said, we have to go there. Why? Because it was on TV. I mean, that's, isn't that what advertising is for? So that we can, we can just say, oh, that place was on TV. Let's go there. And so we, we did that and it was good. It was, it was good, good uh, frozen yogurt. Not ice cream, frozen yogurt. I, I think I still prefer ice cream at the end of the day, but that's not important. The, the reality though, uh, that that this show brought to the to the forefront of its viewers was that sometimes the CEOs of big companies can be almost disconnected from what's happening in the day to day, and so the idea behind the show is that these CEOs would go undercover in their own company. So they'd get this whole makeup, get up, and they would have look completely different um, than they than they did on their day-to-day -day, uh, life and, and job practice. And so these undercover now bosses or CEOs would go into these company locations and they would work side by side with the people that basically were the engine of their company. And every, every episode was, was about the same. The, the, the boss man would go into the company and he would, he would scout things out. He would get to know people. He would see sometimes uh, the incredible sacrifices that employees were making for their company to make sure it was the best company it could be. And um, it, it kind of reminded me of what my dad used to tell me. He says, it doesn't matter where you work, but the best thing that you can do for any place that you work is to try to make that company the best that it can be while you're there. And that was basically, the, some of these employees just went above and beyond. Now there was the odd cookie who, who basically got a, a nice talking to uh, at the end of the episode. But, but for the most part, there was heartfelt employees who cared about the company and wanted to see it succeed. And so at the end of every episode, the, the, the CEO would, would call these individuals to head office. And as they would come into head office, they would uh, be introduced to the, to the CEO of the company. And then at, as they introduced, he would say, but you may know me as, and he would introduce himself as the undercover boss. And in a lot of these things, um, these people were given a lot of times incredible gifts at the end of the show. Uh, maybe it was a, a vacation for their family or uh, they were gonna buy them a new vehicle or they were gonna help with college or, or, or whatever the scenario was, the, the CEO generally went above and beyond to just say thank you for the people who had, who had helped him along the way, who had made his company a success. And, and when we think about this show, it kind of reminds me that we oftentimes can lose sight of what we have to be thankful for. Whether we're a boss or whether we're an employee, whether we're running the day-to-day the -day operations of a, of a workplace or whether we're trying to run the day-to-day -day operations of a home, a lot of times we can get into the day in, the day out, and we can get into a grind where we lose sight of what we really should be paying attention to. Now, a lot of these employees on this show that were singled out or called into head office, usually were working and giving it their all in the midst of hardship. And one of the things about hardship is hardship teaches us to be thankful. It teaches us to be grateful and content with what we have. And I just wanna say this morning, as we get into this idea of joy and this idea of contentment and this idea of being thankful, um, we have a lot to be thankful for. Now, we can look at our world today and be like, I don't understand where you're coming from. I don't get it. Well, we, we, can, we can take a breath this morning. If you're watching this in the comfort of your home, you have a TV or a computer. You have internet, more than likely. Odds are, you know what, like, you have clothes 
that you can put on. You have some food in your cupboards or fridges. You have uh, some sort of transportation that's reliable. For, for most of us, we can go on and on in the list of things in our lives and we can say, you know what, God, thank you so much. We have so much. And I was, I, I've been struck sometimes by the, by the little memes and things on Facebook recently where it talks about just that, about how we can, we can get up and, and we can go and open our computer or turn on our TV and we can, with the technology available to us uh, and the resources available to us, we can still be encouraged together as the, as the church, excuse me. And that's, that's pretty amazing. But as we think about that, can we have all of those things? Can we have so much more than even sometimes the rest of the world and yet still not be content, still not be satisfied? And so what does it mean to be content? That, that becomes the question, right? What is contentment? Well, according to Webster's dictionary, the contentment is the state of being happy and satisfied. Now, when I read that, um, it reminds me of uh, a family that, uh, that I knew back when I lived in Wisconsin. Um, and they were, they were a, a bigger family, I believe, and, and they would go to, they get invited to people's houses, and, and the mom would say FHB, which was family hold back. And uh, it was just kind of this way of saying, you know what, guys, if we don't get enough here, we can go and eat more at home. We don't want to clean these people out of their house. But, but it was funny because out of that stemmed this new kind of acronym, FFH. Now you guys may go like, what is FFH? And it was what we started to say after that when we would, we would be full and happy, usually after eating a, a large piece of red meat that had been grilled to perfection or a, or a nice cheeseburger or a, a pizza. Uh, all of the things which I, I love to eat, but he would say, we would say FFH, now we are full, fat, and happy. We were satisfied. And, and as we think about that, Webster's defines contentment as simply being happy and satisfied. Happy and satisfied. Now, biblically, according to the New Bible Dictionary, um, says contentment and satisfaction denotes freedom from reliance upon others, whether a person persons or other things, hence the satisfaction of one's needs or the control of one's desires. It is not a passive concept or pa passive acceptance of the status quo, but a positive assurance that God has supplied one's needs and the consequent release from unnecessary desire. Now what the Bible uh, dictionary here defines for us is that, is that true contentment and satisfaction is not dependent upon other people. It's not dependent even upon what you have. But biblical contentment is when we look to God and we are satisfied in him. Completely 100% satisfied. Which means we also trust in him. Which means we also look to him for all things. That's what it is to be content. Not a passive acceptance of the status quo. I'll read that again but the positive assurance that God has supplied one's needs and the consequent relief from unnecessary desire. You see, contentment understands that God has given us what we need. And isn't that what the word promises? Isn't that what God's word tells us? That, that God provides for the sparrows. And yet, how much more does he love us? And will he not provide for us? Even in the Lord's Prayer, does he not... Does he not go and, and teach his disciples to pray and give us this day our daily bread? God, we look to you for the supply of all our daily needs. And to be honest with you, oftentimes we have more than what we need. And I'm not saying that so you feel bad. And I'm not saying that God wants you to go live with no electricity or, or no internet either. That's not what I'm trying to say. But, but to put in perspective... Contentment is understanding that God has given us all we need. Anything extra is just bonus. So if you guys have your Bibles this morning, open up to the book of Proverbs chapter 15. And we're going to look at verses 16 and 17 this morning. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 16 and 17. Now the, 
the author of Proverbs is Solomon. He was the wisest man in history. Um, he wrote the entire book of, uh, of Proverbs. He also wrote Song of Solomon. Um, but in his wisdom, he catches these little snippets, these little nuggets of, of, of wisdom and enlightenment for us as believers to glean from. And, and Proverbs chapter 15, verses 16 and 17, talks about contentment. And the wisest man in history wrote, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than the fattened ox and hatred with it. You see, what Solomon knew and understand and what we all need to understand, it's better to have a little bit and have the fear of the Lord, have the understanding of who God is and, and, and to worship him and to, to fall down on our knees before him. He says that's far better. The worship of God, the love of God, the knowledge of God, the relationship we have with God, it is better to have a little bit of that or a little bit of, of, of supplies, a little bit of stuff and a lot of the fear of the Lord than it is to have a lot of stuff and a whole bunch of trouble that comes with it. I mean, I'm sure you guys have all heard at some point in time where... Money is the root of all evil. Greed is one of the things that the Bible talks about often, about how it, it is not a good thing. It is not a positive thing. And, and our world that we live in says you have to have more. You have to have more. You have to get more. You have to climb the ladder. You have to be more successful. You have to have the best job. You have to have the most income. You have to have all of that stuff. And there are so many times that, that when we climb the ladder, when we get to the top, when we have achieved all of our goals, when we have made all the money, when we have acquired all the stuff, that we sit back and we can say, I don't think I'm any happier. I don't think I'm any more satisfied. You see, oftentimes as people, we think if we just have a little bit more, if we just have some extra if we just can get that next promotion, if we can just get that next car, if we can just get that and you can fill in the blank, then I'll be happy. But how many people have the fatted calf or great treasure, but all it does is bring trouble into their life? I bet you if Solomon could go back and say, yeah, I had a lot of stuff, I had a lot of riches, but you know what, if I could give it all up and just have God, I would be content with that. I bet you Solomon would tell you that. I bet you we could look at his life and he could look back and say, you know what, what? in Ecclesiastes, didn't he say meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless? Everything is just a chasing of the wind. You see, better is a little fear of the Lord than great treasure and the trouble with it. It's better to have a dinner of herbs or, or vegetables. Now, I, I, I kind of lean towards not agreeing with, um, with, uh, with Solomon on this one, just my personal take, because I love, I love meat. I love steak, I love chicken, I love pork, I love that. But, but what, what the point is, he's not saying that, that the absence of meat is gonna make you happy. Or the presence of meat is going to make you happy. But he says, if you have the great feast in front of you and all the trimmings, but there's not love in the midst of it, what's the point? I think as the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the church in Corinth, said, he said, look, if I, if I could be the most eloquent speaker, but I don't have love, then, then everything I say is meaningless. Paul said, look, I can prophesy, I can do all that stuff, but if I don't have love, then it's meaningless, it's pointless, it doesn't matter for anything. And that's what Solomon's saying here. He says, you can have it all, or you can have a little, and if you have love and you have the fear of God, then he says that is much better and much more satisfying and is going to bring joy and contentment to your life more than if you had it all. If you had great treasure and all the, the best food in the world... If you have the fear of God and love, that's far better. 
Doesn't the Bible say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Now, I just want to talk about contentment for just a couple minutes here. A couple reasons why we should be content. We should be content because the Lord has provided for us. I wrote my notes here. We should be content because we were able to eat today. Matthew chapter 6. If you guys want to turn there in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 6 verses 25 to 26. It says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink. Nor about your body or what you will put on. It is not, is not life more than food. And the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more of more value than they? You see, Christ teaching his disciples says, hey, look up here at these birds. Look up here at these birds. Do they go hungry? Are they dying of starvation? No, he tells his disciples, he says, look, you worry about the things in life, which we all are guilty of. We have all worried. We would be silly to say that we haven't worried at some point in time during this, these last few weeks. We all worry. And he says, don't be anxious about your life. He says about what you will eat or what you will drink or, or about your body and what you're going to put over it, what, you're gonna, what kind of clothes you're going to wear. He says, life is more than just food and clothing. Life is more than that. And he says, if we understand that God is taking care of the birds and we are more valuable to God than the birds, then doesn't it make sense to say also that, that God is going to love and take care of us more than he does the birds? You see, we can face life and we can be content maybe just because of the fact that we have some food in our house. Sure, maybe it's not the fatted calf, but we, we can eat. Don't be anxious. Life is more than food. Look at the birds. If God takes care of them, how much more is he going to take care of you? But we also have to understand that God allows the situations that we find ourselves in. Now, I, I, I want to preface that by saying not every situation you're in is because of God. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations that God never intended for us to be in, that God never wanted for us to be in. But the reality is we find ourselves in situations and circumstances sometimes because of our own life choices, because of the things that we chose that were outside of God's will. Now, can God work in those situations? Absolutely. Does, does God work in those situations? Absolutely. But I believe that God is, God is in control. God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. And so we can be content where, wherever we find ourselves, whatever situation we may be facing. Turn with me over to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have re revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, we love Philippians 4.13. Don't get me wrong. I love that verse. It has been a staple in my life since I first got saved. But oftentimes we look at that and we say, God, I'm going to climb Everest. Or God, I am going to be the fastest man alive. And then Hussein Bolt comes along and then we're all, no, that's not going to happen. But the reality is, what he says is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he's saying is, he says, when it comes to life, 
When it comes to circumstances, when it comes to the places we find ourselves, he says, whether I am in plenty or in hunger, whether I have abundance or need, I have learned that in whatever situation I find myself to be in, to be content. Because if God has me there in that moment, then I can do what he's, he's put me there to do because I have Christ. You see, in this time that we live, in this uncertainty from day to day, do we look at each day as though God has a plan and a purpose? Do we wake up in the morning and say, okay, God, what are you going to do today? How can you use me to be a light in our community? God, how can you use me to share the gospel with somebody today? God, how can you work in and through your church in this world right now? You see, because what Paul would have said, he says, look, yeah, it's, it's a crazy world right now. It's, it's upside down. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't, I don't understand how it's all going to pan out. And, and Paul would say, that's okay. That's okay that we don't know what life is going to be like in another month. It's okay that we don't know even what life is going to be like in another week because today is today. Today is what we have. Today is what God has given us. And so, so Paul would say, look, here's the secret to being content with where you're at. Understand the one who is seated on the throne. Understand that right now, in this moment in your life, God has given you the ability through Christ Jesus to do what he's called you to do. So let's be content with where he's placed us. Maybe that's in a home with your family around you. Maybe that's by yourself right now. But do we believe that God's in control? How can God use you right now? Have you guys asked yourself that? God, what is it that you desire to use me for? God, where can I be used? How can I be an encouragement to somebody else? And Paul, what I love about this, doesn't negate that life isn't, he doesn't say, well, life should be easy. No, he says, sometimes it's, it's good, it's plentiful, sometimes it's hard and difficult. Sometimes life is hard because of our own making. Sometimes life is hard because maybe we do have a need at that moment. I'm always, uh, I'm always taken back to Harold Holman, uh, a teacher of mine uh, when I was in Bible school, and he shared the story as he was thinking about, as they were going home one day uh, to, their, to their house, him and his wife, and uh, his wife said, I think we should give that $10 to this family. And Harold said, I was thinking to myself that I have to buy milk, bread, and eggs with this $10 for my family. I don't know if I can just stick it in somebody else's mailbox and hope for the best. Now, what's interesting is it was, you're thinking $10, well, that's not really a big deal. But it was the last $10 that the Holman family had at the time. And his wife said, I really think we should give it to him. I really, I really do. I really think we should, we should give it. So just, just put it in their mailbox. And so he did. He put, he put the $10 in their mailbox and, and he walked home. And as he got home, he saw on the front step there was a brown bag. And he got up to it and what was in the brown bag was milk, bread, and eggs. The exact same stuff that, that he was going to buy at the grocery store with the 10 bucks he put in the mailbox. And, and that, is, that is what trusting God looks like. That story has always stayed in my mind. Because sometimes it means that, you know what, we take a step back and we realize, you know what, I don't have a lot, but maybe somebody has a greater need than I do. Maybe life is hard right now, but I know that, that God is still ultimately going to meet my needs. I understand that life is not going to be the way that I always want it to be. And I'm okay with that because God is leading my life. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me right here, right now. And so we're content because we follow the God who's in control. We're content, completely satisfied in any situation that we find ourselves in because we know that that is where God has put us. That's where God wants us. 
And that used to be said to me uh, in my in my church that I grew up in, or I shouldn't say grew up in, but I, I spent the early years of my, my Christian life in. There's no safer place to be than in the center of God's will. And when we're in the center of God's will, can, can't we just be the most content and satisfied right there? Whether that means we have plenty or whether we are lacking, God supplies all of our needs. You see, I, I believe that's why he gave us this verse in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I love this verse. It's probably, I shouldn't say one of my new favorites, I've read it before, but, but it's really kind of stood out to me over the past couple of days. Fear not, don't have any fear. Don't be afraid of what's gonna happen tomorrow or what's even gonna happen today because God is with us. Do not be dismayed, don't be distraught, don't be frantic or anxious because I am your God, he says. And he says, I will strengthen you. I will give you the strength to face this day. I will help you through it. Isn't it, isn't it great that sometimes when we feel the most alone, when somebody comes alongside of us and says, hey, I got your back, that we feel so much better about life. This is God saying, I've got your back. This is God promising his people, the nation of Israel, I've got your back. If you will follow me, if you will trust me, if you will put your hope in me, if you will be content with where I have you right here, right now, with all that you have, whether you think it's what you need or not, if you will just be content and satisfied, trusting me, looking to me, loving me, he says, You'll be reminded of the fact that I am your God. There is no need to fear. And I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will be with you every step of the way. So maybe tomorrow you're going to wake up and, and you're going to look at life and you're going to see the hardships that face you and the difficulties that are there. And you're just going to say, you know what, God? God, you're my God. You are with me. You're going to help me today. Give me your strength. Lead and guide me by your hand. Help me to be content with what I have today, where I am today, what you're doing today. You see, when we look at the scriptures, we are told continually to be thankful in all things. Thankful in all things. I remember being taught when I was uh, in Bible school and, and even by some of my mentors that when we pray, we should always start with thanksgiving. Always. Always start with, with thanking God for something he's done in our life. Thanking God for something he's provided for our lives. Thanking God for the blessings that we have. And I have been thinking about that lately as I have been praying. God, thank you so much for all that you've done for me. God, thank you for Jesus who died for me. God, thank you so much for the food that I was able to eat today. God, thank you so much for the house and the roof and the shelter that I have over my head. God, thank you so much, Lord, even during this time for the continued health that my family and I have. We have so much to be thankful for. I remember being challenged by my mentor even with an individual that I didn't get along with well and really struggled with. And he says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to do every day. I want you to take this individual to prayer. And I want, you to, I want you to start by saying, what is it that you can thank God for in his life? I tell you what, when we begin to see, see life through the lens of thankfulness, you know what happens? We become more content with God. You see, thankfulness moves us to contentment. Contentment then moves us to joy. I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about that. We, we have not only food, not only shelter, but we, we have Christ. We have Christ who, who gave us his, his life so that we could have eternal life, so that anybody who believes in him will, will be automatically translated from eternal death and condemnation and hell to eternal life with Jesus forever. We have mercy, we have grace, we have forgiveness, we have uh, we have hope. We have joy because of Christ. And as we think about 
all of these things in the context of fear, I want us to, to look and say, you know what? One of the things that can drive out fear is faith in God, absolutely. Hope in God, absolutely. You know what I mean? The love of God, absolutely. But another thing that can, that can totally drown out the fear that sometimes we want to, to feel, we want to cling to, we want to say because for whatever reason, we, we, we let it drive us. Joy can just smash that fear down. Contentment. Thankfulness should lead to contentment. Contentment should always lead to joy in Jesus Christ, joy in the Lord. Isn't that what James talks about when he says in James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3? Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Isn't that a... Uh, that verse is just so counterintuitive and so countercultural to what we, what we normally think. But he says, count it all joy. When you face difficult things and trials and hardships, he says, can you take joy in those difficult times? You see, I believe we have two responses when we, when we face situations that cause fear, situations that are difficult and hard. Is That's either fear and cower and run away from or to look at and say, you know what, God, you are doing something here. You are teaching me something now. You are at work in my heart, in my life, and at work in the life of other people in this world. And so, God, I am going to count it all joy because I know if we continue reading in verse 3, for you know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. That these hard and difficult times make us steadfast in our faith. They make us consistent. They make us, uh, make us rock solid, if you will. And he says, and let that steadfastness that God is producing within you through difficult times have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see, God desires to bring hard times into our life and he allows hard times and difficult times so that he can do his work within us. You know, sometimes the greatest work that God does is when we are most, when we are most under pressure. I don't know if I worded that right, but it sounded funny when I said it. But when the pressure is on, God does the greatest work. It's like we used to we used to use the analogy that that you know what so when you when you heat up metal when you heat up gold what happens is is all the impurities rise to the top and, and they can be removed so that you're left with is the perfect thing. Sometimes that's what trials are for us. They're that they're that melting pot. They're that they're that furnace that we get we get put into so that that the impurities, so the things that God desires not have in our life get removed, but he also can mold us and shape us into what he wants us to be. And what he desires for us is that we are complete and lacking nothing. You see, Paul also wrote in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. We used this verse the other day, and I want to bring us back to it. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You see, God's heart and, and desire for us is not to live in fear, not to live in uncertainty, not to, to walk around, as James would go on to say, that, that you know what, like, hey, if you, if you ask something of God, man, then ask in faith. If you're asking God something, then, then ask him in faith. Not, not doubting, not waving, not doing any of those things. But, but he says, look, here's the deal. Ask not, because if you ask it and you're doubting and you don't believe that God can, can do what he, you're asking him to do, then he says, you're an unstable man. You're like a wave that's blown and tossed to, to and from on the sea. And he says, you're uncertain in all your ways, unstable in all your ways. That's not what God desires for you, but he wants us to be filled with joy and peace, not fear and uncertainty. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. You see, because when we're thankful, we're content. When we're content, we find joy. When we are finding joy, we, it leads to peace. And when we have peace and God working in us, then that leads to hope. And do you see how all of these things are so interconnected? And it all stems back to trusting God. And his perfect love driving out that fear. David wrote, said it like this in Psalm 94, 19. When the cares of my heart are many. Basically what David's saying is when I am anxious, when the worries and cares of this life are, are piling up, he says, and I get anxious. He says, 
Your consolations cheer my soul. He says, I look to Jesus. I look to God. I look to, to the reality of who God is. And I, and I find my joy and my peace and my hope there. You see, God desires not for us to be fearful and uncertain, but us, for us to find joy and contentment in him. So this morning, as we conclude, we take joy in his faithfulness to us, his provision for us. We take joy in his perfect plan each and every day in our lives in this world in which we live. We take joy that his love is poured out over us through the person of Christ and that perfect love drives out that fear that can drive us. So this morning, if you're struggling, if you're watching this going, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but man, I'm still anxious. I'm still fearful. You know what? Will you trust God? Will you surrender to God? This is something I have to continually tell myself too, that, that sometimes when I feel that anxiousness starting to rise up in, in, my, in my chest and in my stomach, I have to say, you know what, God? No, you're, you're in control here still. God, I don't need to fear because you're still on the throne. I wanna challenge you. If you're, in that, if you're in that boat where you're saying, I hear what you're saying, but, but this fear, this anxiety is, is just pulling at me, I, I just want you to, to do one thing. Just take one day at a time and find at least one thing every day that you can be thankful for. Find one thing every day that you can be thankful for. And even if you're not in that fear rising up thing, let's all just do that together. Let's find one thing that, that we can be thankful for in our lives each and every day. And just thank God for it. And then the second thing I want you to do is now that you have reasons to be thankful, reasons to find joy, I want you to realize that if you have a reason to be thankful, that means God is providing for you. God is taking care of you. God is at work in your life and you can be thankful and find joy in that. But the third thing I want you to do is, is yes, find reasons to be thankful. Yes, look and realize that God's in control, but also Find joy in the perfect plan and leading of God in your life. Your life, I guarantee right now, does not look like what you thought it would. I can guarantee that. But God is still leading you. Jesus is still leading you. So let's do this this week. Instead of letting fear and anxiety rule us, and let, instead of letting the situations and circumstances define our attitudes and define our outlook. Let's look to the word of God. Let's spend some time in prayer and let's take joy, real joy that leads to contentment and hope. Let's take that joy and let that be what rules us as we follow Christ. Joy in his leading, joy in his provision, joy in his sustaining and helping of us. Joy. God, thank you so much for your word this morning. God, thank you that we can have joy because we have Christ. God, thank you that that joy can drown out all the fear and anxiety we have because we know that you're in control and you're a God who loves and cares for each one of us. God, thank you so much for all that you've done. God, thank you so much for all that you are. And God, thank you that you are in control of everything. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.